Hello, it's Keith here, and this is going to be a special video with an introduction to the computer's links. Now, this was a system mentioned to me by, by one of my Patreon backers as a system I might like to cover, a gentleman called Richard Farrell. Now, I'd not heard of it before at that time, so I started trying to look into it and didn't really find a whole lot of information on it, but fortunately I could find enough to do some work with it. And so today I wanted to discuss it with you because it's possibly a system you don't know anything about either. And we're going to have a quick look at the hardware and what kind of makes it special. So what is the Computers Lynx? Well, it's a 48 kilobyte system released in 1983. And so it was released about the same time as the ZX Spectrum. And the system specification in some ways is kind of similar and in some ways is very different. It has 48 kilobytes of memory, which puts it into the same category as the ZX Spectrum, but very unlike the ZX Spectrum, 32 kilobytes of that memory is video memory. It's capable of eight colors on screen at a time and it has none of the color clash that the ZX Spectrum had. Unfortunately, that large screen memory allocation means there's only 16 kilobytes for our software, but I think we can do some quite good stuff with it anyway. And because it's such an unusual system, I thought it'd be fun to cover and see what we can do with. So you can see I've got my Jinx emulator here, um, which is our, our Windows emulator. But we're going to have a look at the theory before we actually see anything running on it. So firstly, most of the information I've used to make this tutorial we're going to look at today and I'm planning on doing a limited but partial series of tutorials on this system in the future. Most of the information comes from a single document, a newsletter called Linked User, which is very, it only had two episodes it seems, but they were both very good and fortunately that is enough for me to manage to get to where we are today. So let's go into the details of the links. Now the thing that's very odd about the links is the address bus it actually ignores two bits of the address bus, which means in effect it can only really address 16 kilobytes of memory. There were later systems with 96 and 128 kilobytes of memory that had upgrades, but the basic 48k system could only address 16k of RAM. The 32k video memory is paged in as two of the 16k banks. It does also have ROM, which works slightly differently, but this limited address bus means that two of the bits of the addresses are ignored and this has the effect of meaning that over our 64k address space there are two sets of 8k chunks that were repeated in four different locations meaning that if we read or write to those locations we will be accessing the same memory and that's obviously quite important and it's very different to the other systems we've covered. The, the, that was true to some extent on the Game Boy, but of course the Game Boy was mostly a ROM based system. So it wasn't as surprising, but this is mostly a RAM based system. And a lot of its address areas are actually clones of the first one. So you need to be a little bit careful that what you're doing isn't corrupting your own code and things. So as I say, we have these 2K, 8K banks that are called A and B that make up the base 16K. In addition to that, we have four 8K video banks, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. There is also an alternate green, which is actually a second buffer of green video memory. So you could like page flip only the green channel, which is a kind of baffling idea. It makes sense from the sort of human visual system, the human eye sees green far better than the other colors. And I suppose if you were doing a green screen game, it would be great, but there's no option to use this alternate channel as in any other color. You can't use it as alternate blue or alternate red. So it's a bit strange, but that's what we have. So anyway, the, the system memory map looks something roughly like this. It's a little bit confusing, but um, just bear with me. So um, you can see the system memory is split into 8K chunks. And we have four page banking options, which we'll briefly look at later. In a typical system, the first three 8K chunks up to the 6,000 address will be ROM. Then 6,000 to 7,000 will be RAM bank B, and 8,000 to 9,000 will be RAM bank A. The next range, A000 to BFFF, will be the first video bank, either blue or alternate green, depending on our paging options. And then the, the next bank along, C000 to DFFF, will be the red or main green banks, which are the ones we're using. And this area here is unused, basically. Now, the important thing to notice is you'll see I've got these A's and B's all over the place here. If we write to any of these, by default, it would write to the same memory banks as these ones here. So if, if we just paged in this area here without doing anything else and started writing to our video memory, we would actually be corrupting our program memory at the same time. So we have to put locks in place to make the banks read only to stop that happening. It's very confusing and I'll have to be honest and say I've not fully 
I'm not fully confident I understand it myself yet, but that, that certainly seems to be the case, and we'll discuss that more a bit in a moment. So this is obviously very confusing, but I've got a much simpler chart that we'll have a look at later. So bank switching is performed with two different ports. On the computer's links, like the ZX Spectrum and the Amstrad CPC, ports are 16 bits, so we use B and C together when we do out commands. So port FFFF is the first one, and this handles the page banking. Now, we can set banks to read or banks to write, and the interesting thing is we can write to multiple banks at the same time. So what we can do is we can actually set two banks to write, and we can write to the red and green channels with a single byte written. And this allows us to actually save a little bit of time. Unfortunately, as I've said before, the other problem is that either our RAM has to be read only, or when we write to our RAM, we'll actually write to the screen memory at the same time. Because even though these are in different places in the address space, because the whole address bus isn't being processed, actually this bank, a write to this bank, will also write to this bank, and a write to this bank will also write to here. So yeah, I know it's being very confusing here. I'm only going over it very briefly. As I've said, we can write to multiple banks at the same time. We cannot read from multiple banks for, at the same time. And I believe this is actually dangerous if you try to do it because you will connect two of the RAM banks to the system. They will both reply to the read and you will actually cause a voltage overload or something and it can damage the computer. So we can write to multiple banks, but we can't read from them. So that's the first part of video RAM access. Now banks two and three are responsible for the video memory and the, they are controlled here, but we also need to, to lock the bank that we don't write, want to write to here when it comes to actually accessing the memory. This is the video port which controls which banks are writable and it also allows us to use alternate green and we also need to enable CPU access to allow the CPU to write to the banks. It's all very confusing, so there's a very simple way we can look at this. Now, as I've said already, because of the way the memory is competing with each other, reading from the video RAM in our own program is very difficult to do because effectively we would page in the video banks which would overwrite the A and B banks which are our only RAM banks. So our program would actually disappear. So if we wanted to read from the video RAM banks in our code, we'd actually have to write our code first into the video banks itself, which would of course mean it appears on the screen. So from what I understand, reading from the video RAM is only really possible via the ROM. But here are the settings we would use if we wanted to do it. We're going to look more at the, we're going to look more at writing to the video RAM to get text and sprites onto the screen. So the first thing to know is if we want to turn everything off and just use our program code as normal. So the first thing to know about accessing the video memory is how to get everything back to normal. So if we want to turn the video memory off and just get back to our normal program code, all we need to do is write a zero to port FFFF and a zero to port hexadecimal 80 and that will make everything work normally for our program code. When we want to page in video memory then we need to use one of these options here depending on which color channel we want to change. So if we want to change the red channel we need to out hexadecimal 3 to port FFFF and we need to out hexadecimal 28 to port hexadecimal 80 and then the red channel will appear in the C to D FFFF range. If we want to change blue, then we would use the same outs 3 to FFFF and 28 to hexadecimal 80. And then the blue memory would be in the range A000 to B FFF. You can see, of course, this is because they are both in the same bank here. And green, we would, access, we would use different commands. We'd out 5 to port FFFF and hexadecimal 24 to port hexadecimal 80. And then the green channel would be in the range C000 to D FFF. And of course, our green is basically the same. So this is how we port each of the channels in. And we also have to configure the access here to get the system to write to the memory. Now, the important thing to notice, as I've already said, is when we page in our video memory for writing, if we then write to bytes within our normal memory, they will actually also write to the video memory at the same time. So we really have to avoid calls, writing to temporary variables, and even using the stack while these are paged in. We really would want to page them out again. Now, in theory, on some of the systems, the stack seems to be safe. I'm currently using the Jinx emulator. 
Now this one, if I write to the stack, it seems to corrupt the screen, but the pale emulator does not. I think maybe the Jinx emulator is showing more lines than a Lynx really would on a CRT. That's my theory anyway, but as I say, I was seeing corruption that was actually the stack writing to the top address area of the screen, which technically shouldn't have appeared on the screen because the screen area should have left that byte area free. According to my maths, anything above 9F80 should not be visible on the screen, but it seemed to be showing anyway. So um, that was slightly a surprise. Now, one good thing about the link screen, despite it giving us some trouble with regards to page banking and having to um, not use any writing to our system memory while writing to the video memory, it does have one major advantage, and that is that the lines are consecutive. We just need to add 32 to move down a line because there's 32 bytes across a line. So that's, uh, that's one thing that it does make quite nice and easy for us. As I said before, we can actually write to two colors at the same time by configuring the banks correctly. So we can write to red and green simultaneously using these options here, and we can write to blue and alt green simultaneously using these options here. Unfortunately, there's no way to write to red, green, and blue at the same time, of course. It, it, it's a, just a trick of the memory configuration options, and I'm actually using that to write the fonts more quickly. I'm only writing the, the colors twice rather than three times to set the font to white. So that's a nice little trick. So as I said, the um, memory map, if you look at that top chart, is very confusing. So let's think of it in the simplest way possible. From 0000 to 6000 is ROM. Then we get into our RAM area. The first hexadecimal 400 bytes are basic RAM and the stack and things. And then from 6C000, we've got the officially free RAM. I say officially because I'm actually using more than that. And then the stack pointer is at 9 FFF, which, as I said, should have made it safe with not appearing on the screen, but it did seem to show up. Then we've got our blue or alt green bank at A000. At C000, we've got our red or our green bank, just depending on the banking. And then the rest of the RAM is unused on a normal system. But if you have external ROM, I believe it can show up there. So there we go. So that's the memory map. And that's the complexities of the video memory. As I said, I'm going to go over all this in proper tutorials later. I just wanted to give you a bit of a taster for what it's like. Now, when it came to actually programming the links, I was having some trouble because I couldn't find anything to make a tap file for me. The, the, the system doesn't use cartridges or anything. So what I had to do is reverse engineer the tap files that the system creates. Fortunately, the PAL emulator actually has a tool built into it that allows it to take a binary Z80 file, which is just pure assembly, and export it as a TAP file. So what I did is I fed it loads of really artificial things, opened the resulting TAP files in a hexadecimal editor and looked at them and thought, well, what's changed? Why is it changed like this? And so the first time I just gave it the, the numbers one to eight in a, I literally created a text file, converted that to a TAP file, opened it up, then I changed it, add a few bytes, remove a few bytes, and I started to work it out. So how does it work? Well, it's very straightforward, fortunately, and it's not too hard for us to create. I've got a little tool called Binary Tools, and I know there's other versions that do the same thing. And what it does is it allows you to um, sort of add and poke various hexadecimal values into a file based on attributes. So if you need to put the length as a 16-bit attribute into a file, I can calculate that and patch it in. Or if I need to check some, that, that binary tools program will patch it in and that's part of the Acumagic toolkit on my website and it's also part of these tutorials so that's what I'm using to do the job once I'd worked it out so what does the file actually contain the tap file well it's very straightforward really the first eight bytes are the name of the file in quotes now the, the program just gave it the name no name well whatever that's good with me so we'll stick with that then there's a single byte which is the file type and m is machine code so we just need an m so you can see this here and then we need the program length. We need to calculate this, of course, and it's little endian, so the l most significant byte is second and the least significant byte is first. So we need to calculate that. And it's not the, f the length of the entire tap, it's the length of our binary data. So when I gave it the sample file with eight bytes in it, the length was eight. Now the next byte is the loading address. So in this example, I loaded it to 7800, but I've actually managed to get it to load much lower down at 6500, which seems to be safe enough. I mean, technically, I am overwriting the basic stack here, but it seems to work okay so far. So um, that's what I'm doing. Of course, with only 16K memory free, I want, to, I want to get as much of that as I possibly can for my game code. So that's what I've done there. Now, the next chunk will be the program code, which is, in this example, just the numbers 1 to 8 here. Then you've got a check digit repeated twice that the check digit is a sum of all the bytes within the program code. So if this was, if my program was just two bytes 
and the first one was hexadecimal one and the second was hexadecimal two, then the check digit would be 0303. Uh, I don't know why it appears twice. Maybe it's just in case there's corruption on the tape, I guess. But um, that's what it is. And that's actually how I figured it out. I just created a very artificial thing. I was guessing it was probably a sum. So I put hexadecimal one, hexadecimal two, and I found it adds up to three. And that was what the checksum it was using. So now I can generate my checksum with my binary tools program. And then the next two bytes here are the execution point. So you just need, really, in most cases, you probably just want your execution point to be your program load. That's probably going to be easiest for you unless you had some kind of data at the start of your program. And then for reasons that are entirely clear to me, the last byte is the high byte of the execution point. I know I actually made a mistake. This should be just one byte and it should just be 65. There we go. That's better. So that's the theory of the computer's links, just very briefly there. So let's have a look at the links in action then. So I've got a very simple program here that I've started creating. This is sort of the precursor to a proper tutorial series. And what we've got is we've got the monitor that I use for my debugging. We've got my font. We've got a message for hello world here. And we've got my traditional Chibico bitmap we're going to show to the screen, hopefully. So let's just compile this here. And then if I go into Jinx here and I go to file run tape, and if I select this, and it's now loading automatically. And if you'll excuse that rather annoying click, then you can see we've now got the Chibico sprite as usual, and we've got Vasim says hi and a monitor dump. And it, you should notice that this font is actually my default font. This isn't some internal font. I'm not using any of the firmware functions here. I never do. And we've got the Chibico sprite here. As I've said before, the special thing for this system for its age is that this is not a four color system. This is an eight color system using three bit planes. So even though it only looks like I've got three colors here, that's not the capabilities of the links. That's just my sample file is only a three color file really. So, okay. Well, one thing I did want to show you here today, just beyond that is just to make it clear to you, the screen memory. Now I'm not going to go into the code here today, but basically this is loading in the bitmap and you can see these, parts here that are using the shadow registers to avoid using the stack and corrupting the screen. These are paging in the alternate video banks. So I'm paging in the first one here, the second one here, and then I'm turning them off here for the loop. Now what I wanted to show you is if I just put change DE here, DE is the writing destination of the screen. So what I'm actually doing is I'm splitting the bit planes. So I'm loading them into different places. And I thought this would make it quite clear the color capabilities of the system and also the fact that the bit planes are separate and the color channels are completely separate. And so now you can see the color channels are split and you've got this rainbow effect, but where the colors overlap, you do have the white color. Now, because of the video memory difficulties, because you can't read from the video memory and then write it, it's very hard to do software scrolling and things. So you tend to find the games maybe a little slower than other systems. But despite that, the color capabilities are really quite impressive for such an old system. Um, and I, I can't help being tempted to make kind of like a 3D glasses game with this. Be because you've got the red and the cyan separated into different memory areas and things, you could actually do a, a 3D game with the color glasses quite easily with this. So maybe if I get really bored, I'll do that one day. But anyway, as I say, th this system is capable of a huge screen display of 256 by 252 in eight colors. And for a system so old, it's really quite impressive. It's just a shame that that 16K memory limit and that rather tricky address burst makes it a little bit hard to program. But anyway, I'm looking forward to doing some more tutorials on this in the future. So if you're interested, please like and subscribe. And if you know anything about the computer's links, if you've got any advice that I've not mentioned or if I've made any mistakes and you want to correct me, please let me know because I'd really like to make the best of these tutorials as I can because this seems to be a really underrepresented system that I hadn't even heard of, even though it's it was sort of created after my birth, so it should have come across it at some point. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Thanks for watching and goodbye.